Hello everybody, welcome back to the Signal Processing Playlist. The main topic of this lecture is power spectral density. We are going to divide the lecture in two parts. In the first part, we will introduce the power spectral density and we will get the formula to compute it from the discrete Fourier transform of our signal. In the second part instead, we will talk about the Welsh method, which is a more robust algorithm to compute the power spectral density. In order to better follow and understand this lecture, it's helpful that you are familiar with concepts such as the discrete Fourier transform and the window -E technique. Now we are ready to start. The first question we have to answer is, what is power spectral density? We can get its definition by its name. So the first word is power, which means that we are representing the power of our signal. The second word is spectral. In fact, the power of the signal is represented as a distribution over the spectrum of frequencies. The third word is density, because this power distribution is indeed a density. When we talk about density, we are usually thinking at mass per unit volume. This time, instead, we are referring to power per unit frequency. So, if we think at the, the square Fourier transform as a change of basis, now with the power spectral density, we are enriching our analysis with physical meaning, which is the power of our signal distributed in each frequency band. And the next question is, how do we compute it? In order to get it, we can leverage the Parseval theorem. The interpretation of this theorem is that the total energy of a signal can be computed equivalently by or summing power per sample across time or summing the spectral power across frequency. And for discrete time signals, it can be translated in mathematical language through this formula, where the capital X stands for the coefficient of the discrete Fourier transform which more practically is what we get from the FFT algorithm. We want to get the power spectral density. So what we have to do is to divide the spectral power by the frequency range we are spanning. And for the double-sided discrete Fourier transform, the width of this frequency range is the sampling frequency, since we are going from minus half of the sampling frequencies to half of the sampling frequency. And this is the formula for the double-sided power spectral density. To get the single-sided power spectral density, we just need to fold it. And we will see how to do that in Compose. It can happen, though, that your colleagues or friends give you the single-sided and normalized discrete Fourier transform. In this case, this is the formula to compute the single-sided power spectral density. And this formula can be obtained just manipulating the one we have found before. Also here, we can see that we are computing a power density since we are dividing by a frequency. Now, let's get some practice with these formulas in Compose. First of all, let's define the sampling frequency and the time array. And now, let's define the signal as the sum of a bias and a cosine wave. Let's evaluate the discrete Fourier transform coefficients through the built-in FFT algorithm. We can now implement the formula to get a double-sided power spectral density. So we are squaring the discrete Fourier transform coefficients and dividing by n, where n is the number of these coefficients, to get the spectral power, and then divide by the sampling frequency to get the power spectral density. And this is the double-sided power spectral density. We can now fold it. So we consider just half of it and we multiply by two every component, except for the mean value and the Nike's frequency one. Finally, let's build the frequency array and plot the power spectral density. We can see that there are two peaks, one for the mean value of the signal as it is located at 0 Hz, while the other one for 10, the 10 Hz component. Now we can try to implement the other formula we've written before. To do that, let's compute a single-sided uh, discrete Fourier transform. And now let's write the, the formula. What we should obtain is the single-sided power spectral density, but let's verify it by plotting. 
and in fact we see that we get the same PSD curves. Now we have some good basis to move to the second part of the lecture. And you might wonder why we need to introduce another method if we are already able to compute the power spectral density. I'll give you at least two reasons to do that. The first one is that so far we have always considered perfect signals. Instead, our signals are usually affected by noise. Even though there is noise, we want to get a good estimate of the power spectral density. The second one is that the power spectral density is typically used to characterize not deterministic process. And also in this case, we want to have a power spectral density estimate, which is enough representative of this random process, even though we have a single measurement of it. In both cases, averaging might represent a good solution, and in order to perform some averaging, we should have multiple signals, but we only have one. What we can do is to artificially build more signals, and to do that, we can split our signal in two segments. After that, we will apply the fast Fourier algorithm to each segment. In order to reduce leakage, we can use some windows. So we can multiply each segment by the function, the window function, and then we compute the discrete Fourier transform. From each discrete Fourier transform, using the formulas we obtained in the first part of the lecture, we can get the corresponding PSD. And as the final step, we take the average of all the PSDs we obtained in order to come up with a single PSD. But this is not yet the Welsh method. To get it, we need to slightly modify the first step. When we are applying a window function to a signal, we are modifying it. And what happens is that we are kind of neglecting the first and the last part of each segment, where the window coefficients are small. This means that we are not efficiently using our signal and also that we might lose some important information if they occur in these areas. So to avoid that, what we do is to divide the signal into overlapping segments. Everything else remains the same. So we multiply each overlapping segment by the window function, we compute the FFTs, we apply the PSD formula and we average all them together to get a PSD. And the beauty of Compose is that all these steps are performed with one line of code. In fact, we can leverage the Compose built-in function called pwalch. This is the most complete syntax to call it. It gives as output the frequency beams and the relative PSD values. And it takes as input the signal, the window coefficients, the amount of overlap, the length of the FFT, which usually is the same as the length of the window, the simple frequency, and a control string to specify if we are asking for a single-sided or double-sided power spectral density. The number of segments is determined by dividing the length of the signal with the length of the window. Moreover, when we apply the window, the pwalch function automatically computes and applies the correction factors to our signal in order to preserve its energy. In case some of these input parameters are not given, of course, they will assume default values, as explained in the help page. But let's see it in practice. So let's consider another signal made up of three sine waves and with a mean value different from zero. This time, let's add also some random noise and let's visualize it. Now let's compute the power spectral density with the first formula we have used before. And to do that, just copy and paste the relative part of the previous script. Let's plot it. We see that there are four peaks, one for the mean value and the other three for the frequency content of each sine wave. But there is also some amount of noise. And finally, let's compute the power spectral density with a pwatch function to that, let's use the full syntax and let's define all the input arguments. We want to divide our signal into 10 segments, so our window's length has to be one tenth of the length of the signal. Let's use a rectangular window. 
then we need to define the overlap. Let's set it to 50%, which means that the number of overlapping points is one half of the length of the window. We are using the round function to be sure that we are defining the an integral number of overlapping points. Then we need to define the length of the f of t. The typical choice, which is the one we are also adopting here, is to set it equal to the length of the window. In case you set it to be longer than the window, the signal gets zero padded. And of course, you cannot set it shorter. The sampling frequency is the one that we have defined at the beginning of the script. Finally, we want to get by the single sided spectrum, hence we set the range to one sided. All the inputs have been defined, so we can plot it. We see that there are four peaks again, but this time their values are smaller. We don't have made any mistake, in fact there is a reason for that, and to better visualize it, let's get rid of noise. We can explain it in two ways. Let's compute the energy of the signal from both the PSDs. And to do that, we are leveraging the formula we have obtained in the first part of the lecture. And we see that the energy of the first PSD is 10 times the energy of the second one. And that is right because we have obtained it from a signal which is 10 times longer. The second way to explain it is to look at the x-axis. We see that the distance between frequency beams is different, and for the red curve, it's 10 times bigger than the blue one. This is because when we split the signal, we are also decreasing the acquisition time, hence the frequency resolution gets lower. And the PSD is a density measurement, and we are normalizing it with two different frequency resolutions. The power, though, stays the same, and you can verify that just computing the area below the two curves. Here, we will do that just for a small range of frequency, let's say from 90 to 21 Hz. The area under the blue curve is given by the area under the blue triangle, whose peak value is 45 and whose base is 0 0.2 while the area of the red curve is given by the area below the red triangle whose peak value is 4.5 and the base is 2 and we can see that in fact they are the same and this also leads us to the last consideration. When we apply the P. Welch method, the frequency resolution gets lower. And of course, some leakage can occur if we do not have the right frequency beams to properly represent the frequency content of the signal. If we change this frequency to 5.5 Hz, for example, you notice that the red PST, which is the one obtained with the P-Walsh, will suffer from leakage. At this point, you should have a good understanding of the physical meaning of the power spectrum density. And you should also know how to implement the P-Walsh method. And you should be aware of the advantages as well as of the disadvantages of this method. And the last thing you might want to do is to try different input arguments for the P-Walsh such as the window type, the window length, or the overlapping. You can do it through the exercise we have worked on, or with this app that I'm about to show you. In this app, you can see there are three plots. In the top one on the left, we will plot our signal in time domain, and our signal is made up of three cosine waves, and we can set their amplitude and frequency through the sliders. Moreover, we can add some random noise and also an additional signal. Instead, the other plot is used to represent our signal after some processing, which is splitting into segments, overlapping and windowing. And these PST parameters can be defined through these Y controls. 
And, and finally, in the plot on the right, we will plot the computed power spectra density. And there are different aspects that you can investigate through this app. For example, you can see the effect of different windows. In this case, the hand window is reducing the leakage with respect to the rectangular window. Or you might want to see the effect of splitting the signal into more segments. But what I want to show you is the effect of the overlap. And to do that, let's add the additional signal, which has been properly designed for this purpose. We can see that this additional signal occurs only at certain instance, and it lasts for a really short time. When we split the signal and we apply the window, we see that this signal almost disappears, because the small coefficients of the window are clearing it out. In fact, we cannot almost see anything in the PSD plot. But if we introduce the overlap between segments, we can see it, and we get a more accurate power spectra density when the overlap is 50%. That's it for this lecture. You will find all the material we have used in the model-based development forum. I also invite you to use this forum to ask any question about this lecture, and I will be glad to answer all of them. Feel free also to post any other question you might have while using Compose. Lastly, and maybe more important, don't hesitate to share in the forum your achievements with Compose. The whole community will benefit from it. See you at the next video.